Lord God is good, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I don't know if promise keepers made that. Did, did promise keepers make that phrase up? God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. I, I don't know if promise keepers made that up. Some of you may not even know what I'm talking about when I say promise keepers, but there was a men's movement back in the 90s, uh, maybe even the late 80s, but certainly in the 90s, and uh, we had big rallies, man. We had like, like a couple of million people at the, at the Washington Monument and all out in that uh, area where the Lincoln Memorial and Washington Monument is just gigantic. Christian men, and uh, it's tr it tremendous. And uh, that's where I first heard that. Uh, and they, they did it a lot there, you know. God is good all the time. And then they'd say, all the time. And then we got, God is good. And that is an absolute fact. We may not understand God all the time, but all the time he's good. I can tell you, I can tell you as a matter of fact, a lot of times we don't understand what God's doing and we misinterpret what God's doing. And it and it, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it gets past us. And, and that's really uh, part of and a good bit of the reason why, why I, I believe God led me to John 9. Um, I've started last week, you remember, and I know all of you are looking at those 11 points and you're <laughs> chuckling inside um, because I'm not going to get 11. Yeah, you're right. I'm going to probably just get about two of them. Um, but uh, I wanted you to have the whole sheet, and so take it and bring it back, you know, like we do. Uh, sometimes they, they just have to kind of hang on to the sheet until we get finished with them. But uh, I started, and last week I started with the kingdom, and I started sharing with you about the kingdom. And I know to many of you that uh, are Bible students, and you read, and, and, and you've studied the Word, you've been with the Lord a long time, you've been in great churches in your life, that's not really a new concept to you. You've heard the kingdom of God. We've prayed it a lot, even in the, in the model prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. Uh, one of the lines is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's really what the kingdom of God is all about, that his will would be done on earth like it is in heaven. And that Jesus actually uh, came to create uh, the kingdom of God. And it's a tremendous kingdom, and it's a mighty kingdom, and it's a powerful kingdom. And it's an interactive kingdom where we interact with this old crazy world that we live in, where that passage of Scripture that says, you know, you're in the world but not of the world uh, comes into play. And, uh, and, and we are to represent God and, and his work and his kingdom and, and goodness and greatness and, and righteousness and all of those things. And it's a tremendous, a tremendous kingdom of God. That's what Jesus came to set up here on this earth. He talked about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God all the time. And he told parables about it and tried to illustrate it and tried to show it and tried to live it and tried to be it. And of course, we have an enemy uh, of our soul that uh, does everything he can possibly do to keep us from entering the kingdom to start with. But once we enter it, then to make us ineffective and to make the kingdom of God uh, misunderstood, uh, not lived out, not, not practiced. Uh, the opposite of the kingdom of God would be a term we're very familiar with, religion. And by religion, I'm talking about a system of dogma and rules and patterns and uh, laws and, and do's and don'ts and, you know, just a, a ceremonial type of a religious life. And, and so Jesus says that the kingdom of God is, is, is real. It's, it, it's righteousness. It's real. When I say the word righteous, do, do, you, do you know what I mean by that? I know a lot of times, well, that's not a word that you use a lot, but... But when, you, when I say the word, Jesus came to give us real righteousness. Righteousness means I'm, I'm right with God. I'm, I'm, I'm right with, my, with myself. I'm right, right with my neighbor. And I'm, I'm right with my stuff. That my life is lived in a right relationship with all those things. Because if you're not in, in the right relationship with those things, with God, with yourself, with your neighbor and your stuff... Uh, you're not going to have a joyful life. And so you're not going to be living life at its, at, at its best. And, and in the Bible, other than Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Heavenly Father, and the disciples in the Gospels, other than those four characters, 
who who is the who are, who is the the other uh, uh, group in the in the Gospels that's talked about more than anybody else besides God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the disciples? It would be the Pharisees. I know I, I knew you knew the answer to that, but <laughs> it would be the Pharisees. And these Pharisees are these uh, is this super devout, super religious um, uh, temple bunch that pursued Jesus and the disciples, just <laughs> almost uh, harassing them at every turn. Uh, they thought they had real righteousness. They thought that they were right with God, right with their self, right with their neighbor, and right with their stuff. They felt like they had it. But of course, obviously, they didn't have it because they were really the exact opposite of what real righteousness is all about. They were a perfect example of the counterfeit to real righteousness. They were self-righteous. And, and, and this self-righteousness led them to believe that it was their mission to destroy Jesus, that, that Jesus was a fraud, and that Jesus uh, came claiming to be the Son of God, and that was blasphemy. And so they pursued him at, at, at every point. And, and, and so they become the perfect examples of how to miss the real thing, how to live a life that you think is great and perfect and you live by the rules and you obey the laws and you do all of the things right, you celebrate it right, you, you have the right ceremonies, you have the right uh, church, you have the right temple, you have the right place. I mean, I mean you, everything you do is, is in order to uh, pursue God in your own heart, in your own mind. But, but what's really happening is that it's just a subtle form of pride is what it actually is to think that I can do something that will make me right with God, that I can live the kind of life that'll, be, that'll make me right with God, that I can live the kind of life that'll, that'll make me right with myself, that I can live the kind of life that, that will, that'll, that'll uh, uh, tie me to my neighbor and make my stuff right. It's just really a very subtle form of pride and, and, uh, and self-assurance. And so they become the perfect example in the Gospels of how not to live. And in John chapter 9, we have the story of a blind man. And this blind man is going to receive a miracle from Jesus. And this miracle takes about a dozen words. The, miracle, the whole miracle takes about, about a dozen words. But the furor that stirs up after this miracle with the Pharisees and the church people and all the people in the town, the furor that it stirs up takes up the rest of a pretty lengthy chapter, 41 verses, uh, and, <laughs> and, and all of this talk about what happened in the miracle. And, and um, we, we said it just a moment ago, I asked you the question because I, I had that actually uh, in my notes as an example. Uh, God is good and all the time. Tanya even mentioned it. All the time, God is good. Yeah, yeah. And we agree with that. God is good and he's always good. But I want to add one little, one little addition to that. God is not, not only is God good, God is uh, strange. <laughs> God is uh, weird, really. Um, and if you don't like the weird, word weird about God, uh, just say unusual. God is unusual. Because if, if, if what you and I are is normal, then what God is has to be considered certainly abnormal and if you try to figure God out by something from the past, you're going to miss him almost every time. One of the reasons we stand here and pray and I say things about this is, is because most of the time we're looking for God in certain ways. And we're, and, and we're thinking God's going to work in this way. And we're asking God to work. And then we have this thought about how he's going to do that and what he's going to look like and how it's going to be when he does something like that. And if you try to figure God out like that, you're going to miss God most of the time because God, God basically doesn't color inside the lines. God, God, God does some very unique things and some unusual things and some strange things. And I tell you that he does it on purpose, and I know you're not surprised by that. Let's just look at the, at the story here. Uh, John 9, verse 1, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. So now the man becomes the center of attention. 
And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, that was a common term they used, teacher, master. Rabbi, uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, evidently, the disciples have been involved in, in, in this religious system long enough to have it affect them uh, it's a, because it's a lot easier to talk about a problem than it is to do something about the problem. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 4 that the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. And so the disciples now look at this man who was born blind, and they ask Jesus the question. They say, uh, there has to be a reason why this guy is born blind. And so was it him or was it his parents that sinned that caused him to be born blind? And, and uh, talk, uh, talk, talk, <laughs> you know, uh, let's have a discussion about why people are born blind. Uh, let's have a religious concert about it. Let's have a seminar uh, let's get us a Sunday school class together. Uh, uh, they had watched Jesus do miracles before. These decided, this wasn't the first person they encountered that needed a miracle from Jesus. They had watched Jesus do plenty of miracles. Walk on water, feed 5,000, feed 4,000, uh, cast demons out of people, uh, uh, raise uh, people that couldn't walk. I mean, it, Jesus had done many. Why, why didn't they just say to Jesus, uh, hey, Lord, here's, a, here's another. Why don't, you, uh, why don't you change things for him like you change things for others? But that's not what they do. They start a discussion about why people are born blind, which leads to the first point of being a self-righteous, pharisaical person. You might be a Pharisee if you'd rather talk about a problem than do something about it. Pharisees love to talk. I mean, people love to talk. Uh, Jesus is going to cut through in just a moment and uh, cut through this, all this religious argument, and he's going to straighten them out. But, but the point here is that the disciples, the first thing they want to do when they encounter this person with this major problem is they want to talk about it. Lord, let's, let's discuss why, he, why this guy was born blind. Let's, let's see if we can understand it. Let's see if, if, if we can figure out what was, what was wrong. And then Jesus answered and said, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. In other words, Jesus has a way of cutting short this religious discussion. Uh, it seems like Jesus really doesn't have much time or doesn't care much about religious arguments. Uh, they, they would have started a discussion and probably had two or three churches by that afternoon on, um, you know, how uh, this is a church for people born blind right here, and this is why. But Jesus just cuts it off right at the quick, and he says, uh, neither one, you're wrong on both counts, is what he's really saying to them. You miss it on both sides of that, neither him nor his parents. I'm thinking to myself, what could he have done? You know, in the womb, what could he have done that would have been so horrible that, uh, that, that, that he would be born blind? This is, but anyway, then Jesus now makes a statement that nobody disagrees with about his destiny. He makes a real nice statement, real uh, acceptable, correct statement. Everybody's fine. Everything's going good so far. Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. All right, that's the statement of purpose. Jesus, Jesus said, all right, this is why I'm here. Uh, this is what I'm about, and this is what I'm doing, and nobody has any disagreement with this, and this is a wonderful statement, and everything's fine so far. But now, after Jesus says this, everything turns weird. Uh, let me just show you. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground, and he made clay with the saliva. Mm -hmm. Have y'all ever read this? Oh, yeah. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. As soon as he said, I am the light of the world. I'm here to work my father's work while it's day because the time's coming when it's not going to be able to work anymore. And uh, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. And then Jesus went. <laughs> and just, I mean, hello, uh, excuse me, Jesus, do, do you realize that one of the most uncouth things you could possibly do in public is to 
is to spit on, on the ground. I mean, imagine I'm up here, and, and the first thing I do is say, hey, I want you to turn to John chapter 9. My name is... <laughs> you'd, probably, you'd probably say, let me out of here. You'd say, I'm going home. This guy... I mean, no, no, we can't, we can't take this anymore, you know, because dignified people are offended by spit. And so Jesus, <laughs> Jesus just spits right there on the ground. Of course, this wasn't the first time that Jesus had spit. I don't know if you're aware of this, or, nor the last. Matter of fact, let me, I, I just put a couple, would you like to see a couple of them? Uh, I just put a couple in so, so you could see them. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, there's a blind man at Bethsaida. Look at what he had. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Mm-hmm. Now look at what Jesus did. So he took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of town. You know, there are... Some towns that you can't do miracles in, uh, there are places, if, if you think about a town as being a, a, a spiritual atmosphere, you have a town you live in. You have a spiritual atmosphere that you live in. Uh, could Jesus do miracles in your spiritual atmosphere? <laughs> Jesus couldn't work a miracle evidently in this town because there was an atmosphere of unbelief or something, and, and he just takes the man out of the town. He has to take him out of town in order to do the work. Matter of fact, one, the last scripture that I uh, had for you last week, I didn't get to, I didn't read it, but the thing that Jesus did uh, as he began to, as he started his ministry is he went to his own hometown of Nazareth. And that ver- the verse says that Jesus uh, didn't, do many, didn't do any miracles there because of their unbelief. Mm-hmm. In other words, in his own hometown, Jesus did not heal anyone. Jesus did not do any miracles because of that atmosphere of unbelief. And so uh, he leads the man out of his, out of his town. And when, he had, uh, look, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. So Jesus walks up to the blind man and spits in his eye. Of course, he's blind. He can't see it coming. And, and then he puts his hands on him, and he says, uh, do you see anything? How, you, you, how, you, how does it look now? And I'm thinking the blind man's probably thinking, well, you're, you're God. You ought to know. I, mean, I, I know what it is. But he said, but, but he, he goes ahead and he gives, a, he gives a report now. The guy gives a report. He said, and he looked up and he said, well, I see uh, men like trees walking. So Jesus said, well, okay, let me pray for you again. And he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And uh, he was restored, and he saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, don't even go into town again, uh, nor tell anybody in the town. And I've always wondered about that. But, you know, I I, I think I know what Jesus was doing here. Of course, obviously, there, there are places that are very limited, um, you, that, that will never happen. You, why, you're wasting your time praying. Uh, 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 you don't really believe that, do you? I mean, that's the kind of atmosphere that you're around. And when you're around that kind of atmosphere, it's a very limiting kind of an atmosphere for miraculous things to happen in. But, uh, but I, I just uh, I thought about that, and I said, why in the world did Jesus tell him, don't go back in town and don't, even, don't go back there and don't tell anybody about this? And, and then it, it dawned on me that what would happen if people knew that Jesus was healing people? Mm-hmm. You know what would happen? Mm-hmm. He would be overwhelmed with people running to be healed. And his whole life would turn into a gigantic healing ministry of some kind. And, of course, Jesus healed people while he was here on earth, but that wasn't the reason that he came in order to heal people. And so he just he says, okay, don't, don't do it. But, but I want you to see that he, he spit in this guy's eyes. Now, let's go back to another one. Here's one in Mark 7. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his hand on him. So this guy's not blind. He's deaf. He can't, he can't, he's got a, his speech is messed up. And, and, he, and he's deaf. 
and he took him aside from the multitude. Now, the guy before, he took him, had to take him out of the town. Now he's got to take this guy out from the multitude that's around him, take him aside, and he put his fingers in his ears, and he spat, and he touched his tongue. So Jesus takes this guy, leads him over here, says, all right, I'm going, we, we're going to do this, and then he goes, <clears throat> and he reaches out and he grabs <laughs> grabs his tongue. I mean, Jesus spit on his hand and grabbed the man's tongue with the spit. I'm going, oh, I'm going, oh my, <laughs> what? <laughs> Jesus, that, that is something else. Now, but now think about it. Uh, this guy, uh, the, the guy in John 9 is blind. The guy in Mark 8 is blind, but this guy's not blind. This guy sees it coming. And, 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 and before, he can, before he can say anything, I'm sure he probably saw, you know, he saw Jesus do that and then, and then he sees his hand coming for his tongue and, and probably before he can even make a noise or do anything, he's probably in shock like, you know, and Jesus grabs the man's tongue. And, uh, and, and, and then looking up to heaven, uh, Jesus sighed and said, uh, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Talking about his ears, be opened. And immediately his ears were open, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. And I can tell you what he said. <laughs> What'd you do that for? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I can talk. Never mind. <laughs> you know, never mind. Yeah. Yeah. Can any of you tell me why Jesus did that that way? No, you can't. You know why? Because you don't know. When Jesus wants to spit, he spits. You know, that's all I can say. Just about the time you think he's going to speak, he spits. <laughs> Full of surprises. But anyway, so, so Jesus does some unusual things. And if that bothers you, I can tell some of you are a little bit, you know, you're a little bit troubled about this spit stuff. Um, but um, if that's going to bother you, then what he does next is really going to bother you. He spat on the ground. Now, get, get this, get the picture. Here's this giant religious crowd out here. Here are these people that are following Jesus around. I mean, imagine if you're a marginal follower of Jesus. You, you're just somebody that just kind of picked up on this lately. And you say, man, Jesus, I heard about, got a lot of stuff about Jesus, and he's coming through the town. You know, I think I'm going to go out there and see Jesus because I've heard he does some mighty miracles and he teaches and he does all kinds of strange things. And man, you know, I, I, I want to go see him. And, and, and just imagine now you... You, you just kind of showed up out there. You're a marginal follower of Jesus, and, and Jesus is standing there with the blind man, and, 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 uh, and the first thing he does is, is, is just whack, and spits right there on the ground. Okay, that's going to that's gonna shake you a little bit. That's going to be like, uh, man, what did what, he, he do that for? And then, according to the verse, he, he made clay with the saliva. In other words, Jesus gets down and doodles around in that spit down there on the ground. And he starts rolling up little clay balls made of spit and mud, doodling around in the, in the clay. Now, if that bothers you, what he does next is really going to bother you. And he, he takes, and he anointed the eyes, of the, he takes the clay balls up that he's doodling around, got bit, and then he, he, he <clears throat> puts them right in the man's eyes. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking those marginal followers of Jesus had to be looking and say, all right, Lord, that's it. That's it. That's, uh, I, I'm, I, can't, I can't take any more of this. I was, I was with you. I was with you when you messed up the Sabbath day with the Pharisees and had all that controversy. I was with you when you made a whip and chased all the money changers out of the temple. I went along with that. That was pretty good. And, but, and then when the woman was brought to you that had committed adultery and you just forgave her right there on the spot, I'm pretty good with that. But this is... As far as I'm going, this is ridiculous, Jesus. I'm not, I can't go. You know why Jesus did this? He, he was offending people. He was offending the religious people of his day as much as he could offend them. In other words, I ask you, do you know why Jesus did this? And you said, no, I don't. And I said, you're right, because... Uh, none of us know why he didn't do it. He could do it any way he wanted to. He did it some other ways. But he chose this way because we, we all have uh, almost, well, you can describe it like a religious chip on our shoulder. 
And, 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 and what Jesus does often is Jesus just delights in knocking that religious chip off of our shoulder and making us confront ourselves with, with, what, with, with who we are and what we believe about him. I mean, we're always going around spouting off about what God's going to do and what he's not going to do and how he's going to do it and how he's not going to do it. I've been in the ministry, ooh, how much now, Tanya? 45 years, something like that. 45 years, and I can tell you, I've been through everything known to mankind as far as I know about how God's going to work and what Jesus is going to do and what God will do and what God won't do. And, and, and so Jesus here is standing in front of the world, and he's saying, if, I can, if you can be offended, I'm going to offend you because I need people that will follow me regardless of what they think about what I'm doing. And so I'm going to, I, I'm going to shake you up a little bit. In other words, Jesus just loves to take religion and just give it a good swift kick in the pants. Just about the time you get the place uh, uh, nice and you get the people acting right and, and you get everybody behaving so, so nobody embarrasses you in front of your friends at church, you know. This is about the time you get all comfortable with how everything is. Here comes God and he just, he just spits on the place. Why would God do that? Well, it's because... We have this preconceived idea and this mindset of what God will do and how God will do, and God would never do that, and, 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 and how everything is to be done decently and in order, decently and order. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that verse quoted, that everything is to be done decently and in order. I guess that's to excuse anything that might get out of hand in some way, you know? <laughs> oh, Pastor, we need to do this decently and in order. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm all for it decently and in order. But what we mean when we say that most of the time is according to our decent and in order. Not according to God's decent and in order. But, but of course, um, God does what he wants to do, and he just loves to kick that, that religiosity in our life. And, he's, and verse 7 says, and he said to him, now here's the actual miracle. The miracle actually is putting the mud in, and then he says this to him. Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. Now, does that change anything for you? Does the fact that he came back seeing, um, does, that, does that make that public spectacle okay? You know, well, to me, that fires me up when I see, when, I mean, think, do you understand? This guy is blind. This guy has never seen anything in his entire life. And Jesus tells him to go wash, and when he washes, he comes back, and now he can see everything. Man, I mean, that, that fires me that fires me up. You know why? Because we live in a day of, of such unbelief. We live in such an environment of unbelief. Even in church, people are encouraged not to really believe that God can do anything. You know, I mean, God... Uh, we pray to God, we love God, uh, we read the book, we do, uh, but, but I mean, if you're asking for a miracle, man, I, God's, not, God's not in the miracle business anymore. I mean, he did some back when, in the New Testament when, when he was here on earth, but, but I mean, come on, uh, God, God you, you can't be believing that God's going to do all that stuff in your life. So we live in this day where unbelief is in order, and we're told don't believe too much. I mean, imagine that, as if you could believe too much. Don't believe too, too much. Well, uh, what I got to say about that is I spent about 25 years of ministry not believing too much, uh, staying inside the lines, you know, following the rules, being cautious and careful about everything that I did and everything that I said and everything I preached. And you know what I wound up? I wound up miserable because you can't... You, God does what God wants. You, I, you just can't believe too much. And if you ask me, I'm going to go with God. And, 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 and God is going to work the works that he has chosen to work. And if I overdo it and believe in him, then he'll forgive me. I, I feel real sure about that. So the second point or the second you might be a Pharisee is you might be a Pharisee if you're offended by the way God does what he does. Uh, religion brings death, guys. Um, brings a parched, dry, barren life. 
I agree with Mary, I, uh, Jesus' mother, Mary. I know we don't read this passage very often, but at the end of the Gospel of Luke, Mary makes uh, some tremendous statements about Jesus and about about his life, and, and, and one of the things that she says is, the rich he has sent away empty, but he has filled the hungry with good things. Um, Mary's saying, you know, the people that think they have everything are not searching for anything. The people that think they're full are not searching for anything to fill themselves with. And so they're not going to find anything. They're going to be left empty when when they go away from the Lord. But those that are hungry, God is going to fill them up with good things. And religion is one of those horrible uh, experiences in life where, um, where we're taught to believe and where it's demonstrated for us to believe that we have what we need and that we don't need anymore. And we're encouraged to not pursue and not seek the kingdom of God and to allow our own works, our own goodness, our own righteousness to stand for itself. But the Bible teaches us and the kingdom of God teaches us that, that we do need the Lord, that we need to cry out, oh Lord, I need you. I, 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 can't, I can't live without you. Touch my life, fill me up. Lord, uh, change my life. And lots of folks you know they have everything they need except Jesus. And Jesus says, if you want me and you'll search for me and you'll seek me, you can find me. I heard, uh, I heard Joseph Garlington. I don't know if you've, know, if you've ever heard that name before, but he, he was the, the praise leader at Promise Keepers. And uh, he, was, he, he led the music, the praise there a lot. And, and every once in a while he would preach. He's a preacher. I think he's from Minnesota somewhere. Um, He's, he's on up there with the Lord now. I mean, he's, he's well on up in age. And, uh, and, he, and he told a story, I, that, and, and I, it was just so um, captivating about how Jesus, uh, how Jesus affects our life and how, how much he loves us and how much he, he will do in our life if we'll just open up and allow him. It, it just kind of captivated me. And I, I, don't know if this was, I don't know if this was a person in his church or if he was doing a revival somewhere or what, but he said at the end of the service, you know, in, in many churches you have an invitation and you're invited to come, come down to the altar. And when you come down to the altar, uh, if you've been in some churches, a lot of Baptist churches are this way, they, they have an invitation at the end of the service and everybody stands and sings and then everybody that wants to come and give their heart to the Lord or pray or whatever, they come down to the altar and the pastor greets them and, and so forth and people pray with them. Well, it was during a time like that and he said that this lady came down the aisle. She was an older lady and she came down the aisle and, and when she got down to the front, uh, she just fell out. I mean, she, she just like, just nobody touched her. Nobody said anything to her. She just, she just fell out and she got in a fetal position. And as she was curled up in that altar, she began to just, to, to just sob like, you know, her world was coming to an end. And, 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 and finally, after a minute or two of just crying, she stopped crying and then she started laughing uh, as if she had lost her mind somehow. And, 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 and so as the service ended, he said, I went down and, and he said, uh, I, I asked her, I said, uh, you know, what, what was going on with that? Uh, you, you fell down in the altar and you curled up in the fetal position and you started crying and, and uh, like you lost your best friend. And then all of a sudden you stopped crying and you started laughing like, uh, like man, it, it, you're, you had lost your mind. What was going on? And she said, "Well, she said, Pastor. She said I was um, when I, she said I was I was reared uh, in the home I was reared in. Uh, we were Catholic, and when you get to a certain age uh, in in Catholicism, you uh, you have your first communion. And so the girls and the custom was the girls would get a white dress for the communion." and white shoes and pretty and, and be dressed like that for their first communion. And she said, but my family was very poor and we could get the white dress and I had the white dress, but I, I, we didn't have enough money for the white shoes. And so I had to wear the shoes I had and they were black shoes. And so when, when I came to the first communion, 
all the other girls had on white dresses and white shoes, and, and all my friends started making fun of me and, and mocking me because I had on black shoes. And she said, I have borne that in my spirit for my entire life. And when I fell out at the altar, she said, all of those memories just came flooding back to me. And, 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 it, just, and it just broke my heart. And, and I, just started, I just started sobbing. And he said to her, he said, okay, I got you. I understand that. But you, after you sob, you, you just started laughing. Hysterically, you know, like something had just happened. What in the world happened? And she said, well, while I was crying, she said, I had a vision of Jesus coming up to me. And he was dressed in a long, beautiful, brilliant white robe all the way to the ground. And, and, and as I was crying, he was walking toward me. And, and she said, as he got a little closer to me, I could see the expression on his face. And the expression on his face was like a little smile. And she said, and, and I got to thinking, uh, is, is he making fun of me? You know, I'm crying and he's smiling. Is the Lord making fun of me? And she said, and then as he stepped just a little bit closer, she said, all of a sudden, he just reached down and he just lifted up the hem of his all brilliant white robe. And he had black shoes on too. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, what a wonderful, what a wonderful example of the love of God and and what the Lord has for our life. You see, this, this old crazy world tries to convince us that God doesn't care about us. God doesn't love us. God wants things to be hard on us. Religion pushes everything in the world toward us. Religious people, self-righteous people, hypocritical people uh, tell us, you're not good enough. Uh, you know, uh, other people have white shoes and you don't have any white shoes. They're smarter than you. They're better than you. They're more prosperous than you. They can do it and you can't do it. And religion will never lead you anywhere except to despair. But God loves you and God has come for you and God will comfort you in all of your life. Self-righteousness is a very subtle fraud uh, that will never lead us anywhere. And Jesus says, I'll lead you, I'll take you, I'll grow you and if you'll come to me.